Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to another edition of KEU eTalks. Today's topic will be female supervisors, and I have four of the best with me here today, and I'll ask each of them to introduce themselves, and then we'll just get started. I will start with Angela. Hi, I'm Angela Ballas. I am the chief of the launch vehicle uh, propulsion and energetics branch in the commercial systems division. Thank you. Gina? Good morning. My name is Dr. Gina Henderson, and I am the branch chief for integrative operations in the exploration systems and operations division. Thank you. And Trish? Hi, I'm Trish Nicoli, and I'm the branch chief for, um, sorry, now my family's all talking. Sorry, this is already a blooper. <laughs> um, I'm Trish Nicoli, and I'm the branch chief for the technical tools and processes within the technical performance and integration, NET. Thanks. Okay, and Clara? Yes, I am Clara Wright. I am the chief of the Materials Laboratories branch in NEL, which is Laboratories Development and Testing Division. Okay, thank you all very much for participating today. And we'll start with Clara. We'll give you the first question. So Clara, what inspired you to pursue a career in engineering? So engineering, even today, is, is a male-dominated Field. So what was it that inspired you to pursue a career in engineering? You know, there's a couple of things. One being that I was always very curious and I love puzzles and inquisitive. I always wanted to figure out how things worked. And I was encouraged when I was in, in middle school, I decided to go into a math, science and engineering program. And But I didn't think of engineering. I just like the math. Um, I always tell this story that I came from a different country and the language barrier might have been difficult, but math was never a problem because math is the same no matter where you come from. At least for me, it was I, that was the one language that was still the same. Um, so I pursued that math passion. And when I did that, I was encouraged by teachers when I was in high school to look into engineering. We did some summer programs. And I just really liked it. I just my brain just functions that way. Um, and the materials part of it is always the question I get of how do you choose materials? It was one of those fields that I like because it's so practical. Once I went out to college, University of Florida, and you look at all the different disciplines of material of engineering, materials was one where you could see it almost fitting into all of these other different fields. Um, so it was a combination of how I think and how my aptitude towards math and then um, being encouraged along the way and seeing a fit for me in engineering. Okay, Trish, what about you? What what was your inspiration? So honestly, I grew up um, looking at stars. I, I grew up in the north, so lots of northern lights and things like that. Um, but I also grew up in a small community, um, a mining community. So the only thing was teachers and miners. So actually, I had never heard of engineering until I went to college. and one of the courses they told me to take was a career decision-making class. And so that they did some aptitude testing and things like that. And I was always good at math and science and that was always my favorites in school. So I think that kind of predisposed me. And then I went to the different engineering director, uh, engineering um, colleges within the university I was at. And I was convinced that was my path. <laughs> okay, Gina? Gina, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm here. Oh. Okay, so uh, my uh, interest in engineering came my senior year uh, when I was an applied mathematician major, and um, everything was theoretical and just going right over my head. And um, at, uh, your senior year is not the year to change a major to engineering. <laughs> of course, a lot of the engineering um, students that were my friends. Uh, engineering was more of a five-year track, and here I was in math four years at the end of the fourth year and not practical, and I needed to be more practical, and so how do I become more practical was to gain in in entrance into engineering, and so I decided that I would graduate with that math degree 
and enter um, a master's program in mechanical engineering as my route. And I had to go back and do so much coursework in order because I had to pick up all of the, uh, you know, the thermodynamics and the statics and all of those courses that you don't have to take as a math major. Um, so there was a lot of undergraduate courses I had to go and take uh, my first year of my graduate program. And Angela. Well, I took a similar route to Gina. Um, I love math and science, and my mother was an accountant, so I went to school for accounting and quickly realized um, almost in my senior year that um, the repetitive nature, once you learn accounting, was driving me nuts. I like to solve problems. I, I like to solve that problem and then move on to the next thing. So um, once my parents recovered from heart failure, my dad's like, hey, you need to go check out engineering. I think that might be a good fit for you. Um, so I did and discovered industrial engineering and the rest is history. Tommy, Tommy I can't hear. Yeah, I can't hear you. You, you guys don't lip read? Okay, so, so the schools that you went to, the classes that you were in, were they uh, dominated by more males or was there a balanced female to male? How did that, what was, what was it like and how did that feel to you? Anyone, please. I'll step right in here on this one because um, basically um, I didn't get an engineering bachelor's degree. I was in at the master's level. And I can tell you um, at the master's level, I was the only female that was actually there at the master's level getting that degree in mechanical engineering. And it was such a, it was so hard, um, unlike now, um, to transition into this type of environment. All I saw were uh, men. I mean, and you know, there was a lot of sexism that actually went around me actually being there. Like, you know, professors thought, oh, you're so beautiful. Why, why are you here? I mean, like, you know, why? I'm like, why are you deter why are you why are you asking me that? But anyway, um it's just it's just to to be able to uh uh be a part of a group um where that group can accept uh your your thoughts and your logic behind why you choose the things you do because you know engineers we meet in groups all the time and they teach you that at that at the college level you learn that in the collegiate world that you will not be solving an issue by yourself you will be on a team so you're here on a team the team is all men and they do not approach a problem similar to you to your style uh, of being. And so what you have to do is you have to really sit there and try to find your comfort zone, you know, of, of, of making them realize that it's okay for you to be there. You know, um, I think there was a lot of doubt around, why are you here? <laughs> Anyone else want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I was actually in one of my first engineering classes was a statics class. It's at the University of Florida where you have these huge auditoriums, it's like 200 people or something like that. And I did not even notice how many women or men there were in the class. I, I just, you know, first week of class, but I was at the bookstore and I was looking for the book and somebody says, oh, that must be where our books are because she's in our class. And it was just two random, you know, other fellow students, male, and I didn't think of anything of it, but then I was like, well, I don't recognize them. How do they know I'm in their class? <laughs> and then the next time I came to class and I sat in that uh, huge auditorium, there were two women in that whole class. And I didn't even notice. I didn't even notice. So that's when it kind of hit me. Oh, I guess there aren't that many women. And materials, as you get into the higher level classes, there's a little bit more women, I would say, than other fields. But it still was maybe 20, 30 percent. It wasn't, you know, overwhelmingly. And I just got used to it, honestly. It, it didn't really affect me or I didn't let it affect me, I should say. Um, that I, I knew that I could prove myself and I think I just had that confidence going forward that oh, I know I belong here. And so if I ever heard anybody say anything, I just would ignore it. Okay. Hey, Trish, let, let me ask you, why did you decide to pursue a, a, a branch chief position? I mean, you're a well-established 
engineer, you're a little bit further along in, in your career. Why a branch chief position? I guess when it came down to it, I was looking for a bit of a change. And so I'd been working in command control communications for a good portion of my career. And um, I had gotten my systems engineering master's degree. And when the branch chief opened up in the technical, um, the integration and, and the processes uh, division for tools and processes, it just seemed to fit with what I wanted to do and what I want. So using my systems engineering master's degree, kind of it, it grows your level of um, ownership on some of bigger processes across all engineering. So it was just one of those things that it seemed like the next good step and a good fit for me. Angela, what about you? Well, honestly, I started out not really pursuing being a branch chief. I grew my career up to 15 um, in the technical realm, a lot of technical integration. And um, I kind of felt like one of the reasons why I was so effective was because I wasn't in a supervisory role. So it wasn't until a supervisor of mine said, hey, can you go um, act in this branch chief role while another supervisor was on a detail um, that I was introduced to the world of um, supervision. And I, I found out that it it, um, it did kind of align with with my my work ethics and values, and I enjoyed it. And so at that point, I uh, pursued a, a permanent branch chief role. But it was never actually on my radar. You know, like you hear as engineers, oh, why do you want that administrative hassle of, of being a supervisor? And so I thought I had arrived as a GS fifteen, and I just didn't know how much I would love it once I um, did get a taste of it. And you really do love it. I, I do. <laughs> and that, that's a, a good segue to the next question. But before I leave, Angela, I don't know if you have some music on in the background, but whenever you start talking, I hear some music. I'm, I'm not sure where that's coming from. Well, if it's chirping, it's um, the bird. And it could also be that the lawn people are outside of the oh, neighbor's house. Maybe, so. that, maybe that's what it is. No, no problem. We can hear you just fine. I just wanted to let you know. So a good, that's a good segue and, and, and two different paths to a becoming a branch chief. So Clara, let me ask you what skills and experience experiences, both professional and personal do you think help you the most in becoming a branch chief? I would say definitely taking on leadership roles early on, even at a very small level. So being part of a team and, and being that, that go-to person or, or stepping up into that role, even if it's uncomfortable for me, I think that that helped me along the way. I took on added and added and added responsibility as I went on. And to the point where now transitioning into a branch chief, I was already a little bit of a lead in certain facets of different groups and that people look to me to answer certain things. And so that made it easier to, to step into this role of a known branch. I think if I had gone into an unknown branch, it would have been much more difficult. But in this one, this is one that I came through failure analysis and materials and processes and all of the kinds of things that my group is testing and the things that my group is doing. So they were already things that people would look to me for. And so I just that, taking on that added responsibility as I went through and then making connections with people was also very important. I'm seeing now, like, for example, Angela and I worked together for years. And so, I, you know, you start to see the people again and making those connections as you go along, I think is very helpful, too. You're muted again. Jana, what about you? Any professional or personal skills that you think really helped you in becoming a branch chief? Well, Tommy, to let you know, I basically got my GS-15 as a technical, uh, in a technical role through OCE, that's the Office of Chief Engineer at um, headquarters. And um, Shannon Bartell was my mentor. And um, Shannon one day told me, she's like, you could do all of this stuff for the agency all you want to. She said, but it's kind of like an out of sight, out of mind thing. She says, you're going to have to come back to KSC 
and do some work at KSC. You know, I was at KSC. We just had the delegation. I was leading the delegation for the Agency Lessons Learned program. And so I brought that delegation to KSC. But the thing about it was Sh Shannon wanted me to know that there was so much work to be done at KSC and they actually needed my help at KSC. And so when the supervisory role came about because Tracy Kickbush left and I was the 15 that was inside of her branch supporting her. And so it kind of like really just fell in my lap of me uh, going on to be the supervisor. But yeah, so I would say what skill that I possess was my leadership skill from the Agency Lessons Learned program, being able to bring that delegation to KSC. And then the other thing was I was always on these uh, dynamic, highly performance teams where you got to turn around, uh, get, you know, get a quick um, results in a quick, in a, in a quick manner, um, turnaround time, really um, uh, small turnaround time. So I was always on these agency teams like that. So that's what Shannon was actually talking about was got to come off some of these agency teams and start doing some work here at Kennedy Space Center. So that, that's interesting. Two, two of you had your GS-15s before you became supervisors, and two of you were promoted into supervisory positions. Any pros or cons to going one way or the other? Before, let, me, let me ask, let me ask uh, Clara and Trish first. If there had been an opportunity for you to get your GS-15 in your technical field, would you still have pursued a branch chief's position? Um, for me, I guess, I, at some point, I think it comes back down to wanting, wanting to continue to learn. And so in my technical role, I felt like I was not necessarily doing the same thing over and over again, but at the same time, some of the, you know, you're working through problems, you're working through issues. So one of the reasons I went the branch chief route and looked in another was to continue to grow and continue to learn. And that's, I think that's always a good thing in your career is always to, to realize when you when you're getting to a point that you need some additional responsibilities or different responsibilities for you to continue to grow. What about you, Clara? I thought about this question a lot because you do always think about do I want to be leading people or and there's a lot of challenges that come with that of being responsible for a group of people or helping them along or but at, at heart, I'm a, I'm a teacher and I'm a helper. And I, I feel like so, um, you know, that I like that I like being able to be with a group. So the branch chief position has fit me really well. And I maybe even surprisingly so that I'm just I, I like it the same as what Angela said, but I, I do enjoy a lot of it. Uh, but I don't think that I would have shied away from a technical either. I think it was just the right position for me at the time. So if I had gotten uh, 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 you know, so encouraged to apply for something that was a technical 15 that I didn't feel was a good fit for me, maybe I, I may have shied away from that. Or if it had been, why don't you go be a branch chief in another directorate or another group, I may, may have maybe kept away from that. So in this case, it was it was kind of like the, the right combination, but I don't think I would have, uh, if, if like a, a system manager and commercial crew, if I felt like that was a good fit for me and that's what I wanted to pursue, I think I would have probably still done it. Okay. So, Angela, let me start with you. Are there any unique challenges that you face as a female supervisor? Some challenges that perhaps you think some of your male counterparts may not face? Um, no, I, I one, one time I ran into cultural differences. Um, where the other person came from a culture, they didn't take um, direction from females. So that was a challenge. Um, but once I embedded in that culture, um, it, it, it worked itself out. I think that's the only time that it's ever affected me being a female. Um, for me, I, I've heard a lot of my colleagues say that um, being assertive um, 
the same as a male. They get they get this reputation of maybe not being so nice. I've actually had the opposite um, coming up through influence. Um, I have tended to be very patient and very tolerant. And so sometimes that's perceived as weakness. And I don't know if that has to do with my being female, maybe soft, you know, she's soft. Um, so, but it's easily adapted. I mean, you just have to, to learn your own strengths and weaknesses and, and add to your toolbox to, to overcome. But I really haven't had, um, any challenges per se being a female other than occasionally I do look around the room and realize that I'm the only female in the room. And I'm like, wow, like, how do we change that? I know the colleges struggle with the same thing. How do they get more uh, females into the colleges of engineering and, and science? So, Well, Angela, in defense of, of all men, we are sensitive and patient and tolerant as well. So, Gina, what <laughs> Especially about you? you, Tommy. <laughs> Gina, what about you? Any, any special challenges? Um, yes, I've had some very unique challenges um, in some of the teams that I've actually managed. And I don't know if it's my voice, um, but I have, um, I just ran into a lot of sexism, discrimination, racism, just unconscious biases that people have, and they don't even know you. Um, they may have heard something about you from someone else, you know? So I kind of like take the spirit on of, of being a manager is um, I, I try to treat people the way I want to be treated. So that means that I don't care how a, a one person treated another manager. I don't take that into account. I give everybody what I call a clean slate. You make your own reputation with me. I learn your own uh, work patterns and performance patterns according to what you show me. And I just feel like I do this because of the all of the barriers and the obstacles that I've, that I've had to confront me. And so um, when you're confronted with challenges and on every end, you just never know like, okay, I get through one and here's another one, you know what I'm saying? And so um, I kind of like, that's kind of shocking to people um, they would think that you would go upon their reputation uh, from another supervisor. I don't. What about you, Trish? Um, so I guess as maybe not so much as a female supervisor, but early in my career, I just remember someone, it was a older male colleague that basically said, oh, I didn't know girls could girls do that. And I, I just, I, I think that always is just in the back of my head that you, there's the people, there are people that will think that way or that's, and so you always, I always feel that you're trying to prove yourself. And I, but I don't know if that's also my own intrinsic, I'm going to do well values, your, you know, kind of thing as well. So, but I remember it just, it always sticks with me. So uh, let me ask, and I'll ask this of all of you. Um, you, all of you have been supervisors for two, three or four years now. Are you seeing any trends that stand out to you? Claire, I'll start with you. In, in terms of how the workforce responds to you as a female supervisor? Well, you know, I'm going, I'm actually going to go back and answer your previous question because this plays into it. Um, the, the one challenge, not challenge, it's just a difference because of me, but I had a baby while I was a supervisor. And so I had to take maternity leave, which would be very different. I have a male colleague who's a supervisor who his wife had a baby, and I think he missed two days or three days of work, maybe. I mean, mm -hmm. I've missed my three months. So that already plays a big role into it. I think it's hard to kind of, to gauge right now just with the pandemic and everything's going on, whether I, I haven't been, I don't think long enough to be a supervisor to see any changes in trends because it's been all like putting out fires with all the challenges of, in my case, having people on site and not on site and the pandemic and what do we do? So I, I, I'll answer your first question, but not so much. I don't think I can say anything about trends yet, just yet. 
Okay, but th- th- let me pull on that a little bit, and I'll open this up to all of you. Are there some things, and just to use the example that Clara just provided, are there some things that we should be doing to accommodate female, fe- not just supervisors, but all females that don't necessarily apply to males? I, I know that there is maternity to leave for females. Do you all feel like there's enough? Maternity leave. Should there be maternity leave for men as well? There, there is. There, there is. is maternity leave as of October the first or September the first. Men can take, I think, um, twelve weeks, up to twelve weeks of maternity leave with their wives. Um, you know, I've been a supervisor for about fourteen years, and so I can tell you, um, mm-hmm. I've seen all kinds of trends. I can also tell you, but I. One thing I have not seen is the trend to increase. Well, that is there is a trend because all of you are here now. But the for so long there was not that many women supervisors in the place. Now I do realize that over the last um, maybe three years uh, there has been a lot of a push for a lot of women in a lot of roles. Okay, and um, I don't know if we're getting. Um, women into those intrinsic places where we need them because you don't have any women that many, you know, if you didn't hire that many as a seven, by the time they work their way up to the 13, 14 level, you know what I'm saying? It's not going to be a lot in the system to fill your different roles that you have. Now, but we are trending up. That's all I can say is we're trending up. It's been the last three to four years. I think our leadership that we have has something to do with that because I feel like I have to give Becky Murray a props. I mean, she's come in um, to any, she came via the NEX, but she's come in through um, NEX working her ranks up uh, to associate director for NE period. And she's been making sure that she can pull um, women along. So advocacy um, is the number one thing we've needed. And so we do have directors and other directorates as women, but they've been so busy working in their own directorate, it's hard to uh, to go across another, uh, uh, another directorate. Engineering is a large di- directorate in itself to have never had a, a woman, you know, as an advocate. Um, they're up on, you know, in the front office. And so so you're, you're getting your trends because, um, you know, there's that advocacy. Okay. It, um, I guess I, what I'd just add to that for advocacy, um, uh, you're seeing the paid parental leave come in, whereas we used to have to take unpaid leave. So that's a, a fantastic thing for women and families. Um, Women had to take unpaid leave? Yes, up until, well, even now, until October of this year, maternity yeah, leave is unpaid. Yeah, or you can use your sick leave. Partly, yeah. But, really? but I would say a lot of people take unpaid leave in the end, not necessarily having built up your sick leave. Um, well, I can say, too, there have been a lot of generous men along the way, because I'll never forget um, I had my daughter, my last child in 2005, and I believe it was Hugo Delgado uh, that was at the helm of, of, of the directorate that I was in and basically gave me a hundred and so hours. Um, so what I can say was that um, men have given to the, to the need, to our need in other ways uh, through those uh, lead donor programs. So that's one of the ways that they've shown their advocacy uh, when we have been out of the office for childbirth. Okay, so so pulling on that a little bit, Angela, what are some things that all supervisors can do to inspire more females to pursue supervisory positions? Um. 
I, I think that that comes down to a daily conversation. Um, and again, with, with the with the folks on your team, with your peers, um, just the art of the possible, like coaching people in the art of the possible. Um, a common conversation I have, both male and female, is um, engineers think you're going to get, you're going to lose the technical if you become a supervisor. So what's the motivation in becoming a supervisor if you want to stay technical? And I think there's a balance and um, opening their minds to the fact that if they're a high performing GS14, um, they're probably already doing a large chunk of what supervisors do anyway with leadership and and moving um, a group of folks towards a, a particular goal. Uh, so, you know, I think having regular conversations about the art of the possible and sharing what you do, um, being transparent about what it means to be a, a supervisor. I think that takes some of the mystery away from from being a supervisor for folks. Um, and also, I think advocating with the colleges, you know, if, if you have the opportunity to mentor or advocate with the colleges so that I know that they lose a lot of female um, students in the first year or two um, and, and, and mentoring or, or working with the colleges to help increase that pool of folks that stay in engineering, because it is still very much a male dominated field. I, I think anything you can do, I mean, reaching all the way back to the college level or I guess even the high school level, although I've seen a lot of high schools come up with some great, um, like Clara mentioned, like engineering and, and science programs, even in the high schools that kind of light people on fire about the field. So that that's that's what I think anyway. Okay, Clara, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, I would say it's also important to recognize that you do have these challenges. For example, I mean, if you're a mother or you're a caretaker, um, that there's going to be those challenges that women tend to just cling on to a little bit more. I mean, there's lots of very involved fathers as well, but um, I feel like women might feel like they have to do everything. And like, if your family is important, maybe you can't move up and you can't be a supervisor, or maybe it's too much. And I think it's just kind of normalizing that and just say, well, everybody has a family, everybody has responsibilities or whatever those commitments are that, so that uh, anybody who's earlier in their career can see themselves like, oh, maybe I could do both of these things. I could have, if that's a family, if that's what you want, I could do that and have this career and go up in leadership. So that, that helps, I think, to have those conversations, almost like what Angela was saying from early on. But, in, you know, Clara, I think it helps when women can see themselves in those positions. When you can see a female center director or deputy center director or a, a female associate director of engineering, I think that also helps to inspire and, and to help the, especially the, the younger females to see, hey, Becky has a family. Perhaps I can someday make it there. You know, if you look at the, the the chief engineers that we have, most, if not all of them, are male. So perhaps if there were some female chief engineers, females could see themselves mm -hmm. in that position. That can also be very inspirational. So a very good um, point. So Trish, let me let me ask you this. Um, what advice would you give females who are interested in becoming supervisors? Um, I would say uh, hone some of your leadership skills. Make sure you've got good conflict management and resolution. Don't don't always back down. If if you're right, you're right. So, um, but those are two skills that I think are important, those being able to have conversations with people, those crucial conversations, that's kind of what I would say. Uh, trying to think of anything else. What about you, Gina? Um, my advice that I give is to switch positions, change of positions every three to five years. Um, I know there's a lot of fear for doing that. Um, I've even heard people say, um, 
in our older days that, that management didn't like you to move around a lot, but you gain a lot of experience when you actually move around and you take on these different positions. But one thing I've actually been doing is seems like I take on jobs that nobody else wants. Um, and you make those jobs better, you know, for the next person who's going to come behind you. And then you go on to do something else. I mean, bring about change. See, people think change is bad, but see, real change is see change. And see change is when you are able to pass things on to the next person and you go off and start something. So when you see a group of pre people using something that you developed or that uh, or a team or, or a tool or something that you devised, you know, that's that means that you're changing and you're you're evolving. And it's okay to go on to do something else now. So there's so much to do at the Space Center. So there's no way that you need to stay in one particular sector for 30 years. It's too much to do. Oh, okay, so Angela, let me challenge something that Gina just said, and that is moving around. I'm also an advocate for that. But on the flip side of that, suppose you find some technical job that you love. And the example that I would use, I don't know if any of you guys know Brad Lytle. Brad Lytle is the crane engineer, has been the crane person for Kennedy Space Center since I have been there. He is a world-renowned crane expert, or was, um, until he left the center. That's all he ever wanted to do. He did not care about a, a promotion or going into management. That was his goal. That's what drove him every day. Um, what are your thoughts on stay? If you find something you, that you like, just stick with it. What are your thoughts on that, Angela? Um, so my thoughts on are embrace it. Um, I, uh, teams need all um, the different skill sets and the different passions. And if you find something that you're totally passionate about, um, then embrace that. And the neat thing is, is there is a technical path. You can you can grow, um, maybe not in a crane operator role. You might have to expand it just a little bit to include cranes and some other things. But um, you know, you can grow in, in a technical role all the way up to the to the SL or the ST level, and and be very very specialized. So. If something lights you on fire, I mean, you come to work every day for at least 40 hours a week, more lately in this pandemic. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, if you're passionate, then you should go for it. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You know, the flip side of it is, you know, embrace change. If if people are asking you to go do different assignments, um, be open to that idea. If you do have aspirations of becoming um a branch chief or, or for that matter, even an ST or an SL, I think benefits from um, getting some supervisory experience. I think we all probably do or team leadership experience, but, but embrace it. I agree, Tommy. Um, if you're really passionate about what you do, uh, then go for it. And to and including, if that means that you're a, G, you're a world renowned GS 13 and you love what you do. Awesome. It makes the agency better. So it sounds like there's some pros and cons to whichever way you want to go. I, I tend to lean more towards what, what Gina is saying, just because that's, I have liked the diversity of the type of work that I have done throughout my career, but not everyone is like that. And there is no wrong or right answer. It's just, what do you want? I think you have to find that niche for you. And sometimes that niche is, okay, trying several, several things, Sometimes it's one or two things. It's like, do you want to go into management? Do you want to stay technical? So it just depends on, on what you want. So let me, let me change the conversation a little bit. And I'll start with you, Trish. One of the hot topics of the day is diversity and inclusion. So what are your thoughts on diversity and inclusion? I think diversity and inclusion makes a better team looking at different backgrounds, different um, experiences, um, getting everyone involved in the conversation and the discussion. I think you can come up with new ideas. You've got, you can have creative ideas and it allows the participation and the buy-in for the community and the whatever you're working on. So I, I wholeheartedly believe in diversity and inclusion. 
Gina, what about you? Well, Tommy, you know, um, I you remember at our last annual meeting last year, I saw that elephant in the middle of the room. And that was just, I uh, want to thank you because uh, you were that comfort piece to me after that because I, I felt them on crickets. It became very silent in that room. And so um, I just want to say that we haven't done what we need to do when it comes to diversity, whether it's women, whether it's, it's race, uh, uh, or racial groups or what have you. Um, I've been looking at some of the data, Tommy, and I can tell you right now, we don't have a hiring uh, rate. We don't have a growth rate. We don't have, all we have is population. And we kind of stick to our population uh, uh, data. That's how we hire in. So that's one of the reasons why one of the comments I've made in one of the supervisory meetings where we flatlined, it's like one black person retires, they'll let another one in. Um, and that's because they don't have anything like uh, growth rates or hiring rates or anything like that where they're looking at the, um, the number of uh, degrees that are awarded each year, okay? And the population of the, the way those degrees are awarded. And so um, I just feel that we can do a lot when it comes to diversity and inclusion. Now, they've added the inclusion as a tenant, uh, you know, uh, to uh, our core values. And so um, it, it kind of, I'm like, why do that? Uh, are you saying that you haven't been inclusive all along? You know what I'm saying? Uh, and, you know, some of us say you're damn if you, you're damn if you don't, you know. But um, is the word inclusion being added to a tenant? Is it really going to change the racism problem that we have? You know, so it's so many things uh, that is stemmed around uh, diversity and inclusion. And the first thing that we have to change is we have to change people's hearts. And mine, and to be honest with you, I don't think the generation that exists at KSC right now is going to be the generation to do it. It's going to be the, the generation Z and beyond that does it. I don't even know if the millennials can do it because we've had some millennials to come in who uh, take on the role of our some of our seasoned workers, uh, seasoned season colleagues that we have. So it's going to take um, uh, uh, another generation to do the work that needs to be done. Clara, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that the, the inclusion piece is very important to maintain a good workforce. It's so because if we don't if we don't already start it at the grassroots level, so start at our ground level or start at, at the branch level where we do not um, we will not stand for racism or sexism or whatever might be. We that's just like not tolerated in any way. And people feel comfortable in pointing that out amongst other people as well, right? If you overhear it, you say something. I think that that's a huge piece because if we have, even if Gina says we're not doing that great in hiring, and let's say we do get better at hiring, but we don't have a good environment, we're going to lose those people. Yeah. And especially there's these companies that are offering all kinds of other things to go work for them that they're going to find if it's somebody who's a high performer, might be a minority, they might go somewhere else. So we have to start out with having that environment that is like every person should be taking that responsibility of how am I contributing to that, regardless of who's in my group right now, how am I making it welcoming for those people? So that's what I, I'm striving to do and making sure that it's just not allowed in any way that you hear of anything that is improper. It's just not going to happen. And then we can build from there, hopefully, and maybe it's not a Generation Z only, maybe we can. Make some footprints somewhere in the well, well, let me say, well, when I say Generation Z, because see, I don't look at this as equality. I look at it as equity. There's a difference, okay? Equity means that you're going to go back and you're going to fix some of the barriers that you already have in place so they don't exist. Whereas equality is where you say, okay, we're going to just make it the same for all. You know, there's a difference. There's some work behind equity. And I'm saying that work to be done, I, some, some people are already in the mindset that they are in and they will have to basically retire out, of, retire out of the system in order for us to really have some true change. Okay, good. Um, another hot topic, Angela, is 
the coronavirus and working remotely. Um, how has that, or has that had an impact on how your branch gets its, its work done? Has working remotely had any impact on your thought process towards telework? Um, well, I'll address the thought process first. It makes this pandemic, um, ha makes me hopeful for telework for the agency. Um, I will tell you that uh, it, even in my group, I had some diehard folks who said absolutely positively, I'm not teleworking. And it wasn't until the, you know, they said, no, you don't have a choice anymore that they would telework. And that's largely because we have some customers that feel that same way. They're, they see value in the face-to-face -face interaction, as do I. Um, but in this pandemic, I think what it's done is it's, it's um, demonstrated for the agency that we can get a lot of our work done and that there's probably some balance. So I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that this has jump-started an embracing of telework that it will um, perhaps allow us to retain some of our talent. You guys were talking about people leaving the agency, you know, like if you can afford them more flexibility and they don't have to be physically in the office every day of the week, sometimes that makes all the difference in the world, whether you're talking about a caregiver or, um, you know, a long commute. Um, and we just launched astronauts largely remotely. So if we can do that, <laughs> I think we can take a look at, at how do we, there's got to be a happy balance once we come out of this pandemic. So um, that, those are my thoughts on telework. I think it's kickstarted the agency into thinking about how do we how do we approach work differently going forward when when we get back to that new normal? Trish, what about you? Um, the work that my group does is a lot of computer process automation type items. So a lot of the work that uh, we've done we could do remotely. So I guess it just kind of helps. People have areas that they can focus and work. So um, I like working tele. I like the telework. I like not having to do the commute and stuff like that. If you need to, though, like we've, I guess we've been allowing people to go in face to face here and there. So if we have walk downs or something like that, but it's been minimal. Um, we've also um, done some innovations where some of the walk downs we've taken cameras and then had the one person do the system and the system engineer do the walk down and record so that the other people doing more of the audit pieces could still do their work based on the images that were taken. So I think there's a lot of innovation, a lot of creativity. I think um, technology can allow us to work smarter, not harder. So I think this is a good opportunity for us to, to be innovative and creative. The, has it had a significant impact on productivity in your office? I think a lot more people are product more productive in just in the fact that they can get a lot done in the time that they have. So Claire, you're in a different situation. You're in the lab. So how has it impacted the work in the labs? It is very different for us, but we do have people going in all the time from the beginning. We were one of the first groups that uh, other other programs have said we need them to be mission critical or mission essential, which means that every single time somebody needs to go in for a lab job, we have to give permission. They have to be on a list. So there's all of these hurdles to even just get somebody on center and we have to go through them every single day, basically. And if we, we can't turn things around as quickly. We can't just have somebody walks in the hall and says, hey, we're having this problem. Let me bring some hardware to you. We have to pre-coordinate all of that. Uh, but what, what I think people are also finding is it's kind of nice to go in and concentrate on your lab work. And you know you're there to do that lab job. And then you can leave the computer stuff for later. You can do the report writing at home. And so maybe people who before wouldn't have been doing a lot of teleworking because they're in a lab, they might be finding that they could do part time. So, so maybe when we go back, I, I could see it that there might be people that will prefer to just go in two or three days a week to do their lab work and then the rest of the time do more telework where they wouldn't have before. Um, but they are at least getting that interaction. They, there are usually more than just one person between all our labs. Um, once they're in the lab, it might be a little isolating because you're the one person maybe on that whole floor. 
So very different work environment and putting having a mask on all day is also very, very difficult. Uh, but I, everybody was just so good at being able to get in and get the work done and help with all of these launches that we've had and all the work that's going on. OK. So last topic of the day, and it is on mentors and mentorship. So Gina, um, what are your thoughts on being a mentor? I know that you are. And what is your advice for people seeking mentorship? Okay, so my advice in seeking mentorship is always choose a mentor who's interested in you. Don't necessarily choose a mentor that you're interested in, but choose someone who's interested in you. Now, the re I hold mentorship to heart, and it's because, like, uh, when I interned at NASA in college um, under Dr. Woodrow Woodlow, uh, he was a very good mentor. He had a project laid out for me. Um, we was dealing with the NAS plane, um, and it was uh, looking at aeros elastic changes around the wing. I mean, it was so interesting. Um, so I try to make sure when I bring in um, students, um, I want them to create those relationships that's going to give them great mentorship outside of my office. Like, you know, going through ATP, you got to choose someone within your office. But I try to push them outside the office. In the recent grad program, now that's the one where you have to have a mentor outside of uh, your branch. And so you push them out there to start building those people who could sponsor them throughout different things. Because believe it or not, in order to get to the SES role, in order to get to 15, GS15, you actually have to have people that will sponsor you, uh, who, will, who will help uh, develop your path and who can actually give you advice along the way, like Shannon. Remember the Shannon gave me great advice stating, you know, don't work for the agency. You know, you're here at KSC, you need to give some of that, your God-given talent to us because we need it here. We have so many problems that you could actually help us with. So mentors help lead your path and um, to, to your future and how your future actually really uh, end up here at, at KSC or any other uh, a corporation is it has a lot to do with mentor development, and so you want to get a great you want to um, you want to acquire a great mentor, but you also want to be a great mentor. And I think being a great mentor has a lot to do with what type of mentorship you've had in your life. What about you, Trey? Um, I believe in mentorship. I don't know if I've. Uh, I've never had a formal mentor or anything like that, but I believe that there's people within my path and career that have um, kind of helped guide or direct or, hey, go look at this opportunity. So it's always good to have some feedback that isn't always just your direct supervisor. I think that's a good good thing. And then like Taco Gina, having either projects, if you're... Uh, for the college internships and things like that, having a project ready to go and kind of exposing them to different areas and different groups so that you can build those relationships and and because that is going to be important for leadership and for um, any, as you, I think sometimes the connections that you make between people are very important in your career because it helps you have influence and um, it, it helps, your support it supports you as well as the other person so Clara what about you mentorship in general has been a very big part of my career both I've mentored a number of people and then I've had a number of formal and informal mentors and I would say it definitely needs to be uh, somebody you're comfortable with and you're comfortable talking about and and I did get when I was early on in my career I, w I was in the foundations of leadership program which forced you to have a formal mentor and it was somebody a little bit higher up and probably not somebody I would have chosen but I thought it was great because it was somebody outside of my group 
inside outside of my organization. And I've seen that. And then through the years, I've seen it's, it's been people who are, I mean, all over. Um, so I think it's necessary to get all of those perspectives, even sometimes to somebody who's not even at KSE. Uh, but you can get so many different perspectives and advice. And they, it's it's been very good for me. And I would encourage everybody, even if they're starting their career, to consider that they could be a mentor to somebody else, uh, maybe an intern or somebody that's coming, because that gets you kind of in the in that mode of understanding what somebody else might need or where you might be lacking. Um, so yes, I think it's tremendously important. And Angela, we started with you and we will close with you. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I echo what everyone said about having a mentor. Um, it can be formal, it can be informal, it can be a relationship that grows organically. And the other thing is, is I think sometimes you, you um, when you get to a certain level, you almost want to look for a mentor who, who will challenge you. So I think mentors um, grow and evolve through your career. The other thing is, is I think it's really important for everyone uh, starting even at the new employee level to be a mentor. So, you know, someone who's just finished ATP, for example, is a great mentor to someone who just started ATP. And um, even just in your daily work, hey, this new person joined the team. Let me help them. Let me share my knowledge. Um, I think mentoring, um, that's like I said, it can be a very informal thing, um, just as something that you do as a daily part of your job all the way to formal for me, I've had some great mentors, and it, a lot of times it's developed informally, and they're still mentors of mine. I still reach out to them for advice. So, all good stuff. Thank you. Well, ladies, uh, thank you very much for your time today. I really do appreciate it, and I will close by saying that you all are an inspiration to all of us. So, keep doing what you're doing. And thank you very much. Thanks, Tommy. See you. Thanks, Thanks Tommy. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.